Okay, guys. So, discussion this week. We were going to be in a field trip up here at the Entomology Museum. And uh, instead, you guys are watching this from your couch or uh, wherever you are. And uh, Brad has been kind enough to um, take some time out of his uh, studies and quarantine to uh, tell us a little bit about uh, what's going on here. So, um, can you just tell us your name and uh, what you do here? Yeah, so uh, my name is Brad. Um, I am a PhD student here in the uh, entomology department at UH. Um, and one of my uh, kinds of roles is, is a, you know, an assistant curator for the museum. Uh, so right now we're in the insect museum. Um, we have, and it depends on who you talk to, but we have approximately 350,000 or so specimens uh, here in this room. <clears throat> you can see we have these nice um, compactors, which helps us to, to organize all of this material in a, you know, a nice confined space. Um, we have them, uh, things broadly uh, organized by uh, or, uh, order. So uh, a large portion of our space is devoted to the diptera, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about why that is. <clears throat> uh, Lepidopterans, uh, hymenopterans, so uh, bees, wasps, uh, coleopterans, and then and minor orders are down here. Um, so <clears throat> some of the major influences to this coll uh, collection have been uh, dipterists. Um, Elmo Hardy is one. Um, another is uh, H. Carson, uh, who uh, some of uh, material from his <clears throat> um, his personal collections is here, um, and and so uh, our function at the university is that, is that we are a research collection, uh, so we cater <clears throat> primarily to to researchers who come here uh, to the university or visit the university uh, to study the various different types of uh, insect groups here in Hawaii. Um, Dipterans, things like uh, the famous uh, Hawaiian Drosophila, being such a, an iconic group, <clears throat> uh, get a lot of attention and a lot of our, our space is devoted to that, that sort of material. Um, other S Sorry to interrupt, yeah, yeah, yeah. so about how many um, different uh, species and, uh, and collections, different accessions do you guys have here? Um, I don't know that much about the number of different accessions. I know we have, let's see, at least these two cabinets are entirely uh, material from this one uh, collection, this Carson collection. Uh, and he did hybridization studies, looking at uh, hybridization between two different species of uh, Hawaiian Drosophila, uh, Drosophila heteronura, <clears throat> which is interesting because uh, it has this interesting head, head shape morphology, uh, where the males have this kind of wide, like hammerhead, shark head. Um, and this other species, uh, Sylvestris. Um, and to my understanding, uh, he, his studies were, were kind of uh, trying to look at species concepts. So, um, believe it or not, you know, the term species obviously is kind of arbitrary. Uh, and so there's a lot of different uh, ways that people argue that things are species, right? So uh, some people will cite like the biological species concept. If, if two uh, groups of individuals can't interbreed and produce viable offspring, then they're not species. Um, <clears throat> but there's a various different uh, arguments that come into play. Uh, these uh, species of flies, for instance, um, may be able to, to hybridize <clears throat> and produce offspring, but those offspring might not be viable. Um, and so the, the studies were, were kind of, again, exploring uh, species concepts using these uh, flies. Um, <clears throat> in terms of number of species, I don't know about flies uh, specifically, but I know for the Drosophila, <clears throat> there's over um, 650 described species, last I heard. Um, it might even be higher than that. And there's pr probably well over a thousand species um, of a Drosophila that exist in Hawaii, which believe it or not makes Hawaii <clears throat> essentially the, the center uh, of global diversity for, for Drosophila, right? We would have more, more species than anywhere else on earth. Wow. Um, and that is <clears throat> in part uh, due to some of these, these overarching uh, evolutionary principles that kind of uh, we see repeated in various different groups of, of the Hawaiian um, Probably flora and fauna. Um, so, the the. Uh, so, <clears throat> yeah. just to interrupt, you you've uh, you guys work mainly with researchers who are mm -hmm. doing um, work on um, <coughs> different insects that occur here, native, um, non-native. I saw some invasive mm -hmm. things, novel hybrid stuff. Um, so, can you tell us a little bit about the pinning and and what's 
the process and the uh, process. yeah, it, just anything about um, yeah. these, these cases. They're beautiful. So, if you were here, um, you'd notice a few things about the room. Uh, first of all, it's cold. We keep it cold uh, and we keep it dry. We have dehumidifiers in the back there, um, and we also uh, keep it. Uh, well infused with this chemical naphthalene. So all of these drawers and all of these cabinets have this chemical. Um, <clears throat> these three things, the coolness, the dryness, and the, the naphthalene, um, are three of the major like in environmental uh, maintenance uh, kinds of climate control steps that we need to take to keep our, our collection nice. Um, bacteria and fungi decomposing our specimens is, is one of the major risks, um, as well as other insects. So the mothballs uh, naphthalene is the chemical in mothballs that prevents other insects from coming in and eating them. Okay. Um, in terms of uh, pinning and preservation, so obviously insects <clears throat> when they die, um, <clears throat> they have so the insects have an exoskeleton. Um, so uh, in order to kind of preserve these specimens, <clears throat> we don't really need to do anything to treat the physical specimen itself. Uh, the exoskeleton will dry um, and they'll <clears throat> it'll stay this nice hardened shell of an insect. Um, larval insects, the vast majority of them, including things even like uh, spiders, things that are, are a little bit softer bodied, more sensitive, we would keep um, in alcohol collections, which are against the, the side of the room over there. <coughs> the pin helps to stabilize the specimen. And if the specimen is too small to be pinned, it will be placed on a piece of paper called a point which is the process you can see uh, here. Uh, and then if you look on these, some of these specimens, like this fly here and these moth, this moth here, uh, those are actually a, another uh, procedure called a, a double mount, um, where the pin is placed through a, a piece of foam, or in this case, looks like cork board even, um, and then a very small pin um, is placed through the specimen. <clears throat> and these pins are pretty dangerous. You don't lose track of them. They're, they're very small shards of, of metal. Um, and so, they, you know, they can get stuck in in hands and things very easily. Um, but the, the primary method and the most common would be this, just a, a single pin. Uh, various different insect groups, there's a, there's a proper pinning place. Um, so through um, beetles, <clears throat> it tends to be through, uh, directly through the right, I believe it's the right elytra. Um, and, are those on the right or the left? Yeah, well those are on the right. <clears throat> so um, you can see that's the same, it goes for all these beetles. Um, for other groups, like the, these moths, you can see it's directly through the, uh, <clears throat> the thorax there. Um, I can't vouch that everything in here is properly pinned, but in these drawers, given that these drawers are full of <clears throat> endemic insects, everything should be properly pinned. But we do have various display drawers where things aren't uh, properly pinned, and that's why we use those specimens for display, because their scientific usage is... Um, you know, lessened by their improper pinning techniques. Mm. You can also see that everything in these drawers should have a label, or in the cases of these kinds of special collections, kind of a, a voucher number of some kind that is associated with data elsewhere. Um, <clears throat> we essentially operate uh, with specimens, oh, kind of like a library, right? These specimens are our books. Uh, these labels are essentially cover pages that tell, about, tell us about uh, where the insect was found, when it was found, uh, who collected it, um, sometimes how it was collected, uh, all the data you would need to kind of go back <clears throat> and either perform a similar collection um, or uh, especially <clears throat> nowadays a lot of people are going back to these locations to try to verify if these species are even still around. Right. <clears throat> um, so uh, one of the things that you notice um, aside from just how beautiful and meticulous the, the pinned cases are is in, in these groups, for example, uh, or even here, mm -hmm. but here with the uh, Kamehameha butterfly, you can um, see that they're all the same, but it's also easy to see the slight variation mm -hmm. across um, in, in certain, uh, different individuals. Yeah. Um, and uh, we can see here um, for the, cl the class, we've been talking about uh, convergent evolution. Mm -hmm. So you guys, uh, watching this will notice um, that uh, the Kamehameha but butterfly uh, could be easily mistaken um, to the untrained eye anyways um, for some sort of regular old monarch type butterfly and um, this uh, morphotype this pattern clearly um, is